by paying respects to the First Nations, Inuit and Métis from the land of the Mississaugas of New Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee and the Huron-Wendat, and to the elders past and present and those yet to come, I pay my respects. And to those who are courageous and have been courageous enough to cross the cultural abyss uh, in this country, Canada, I pay my respects. To those struggling to protect their lands and their rights, I pay my respects. And to those who defended and defend these lands and values, and to those who gave their lives so that we can stand strong, I pay my respects. And to those who reclaim their languages and continue to practice their traditions, and to those who maintain all those great old songs and many that are being made today, I pay my respects. And finally, I pay my respects to all those who use art as the voice of our time. Please welcome Annika Johnson to the Wapata Center's uh, second In Conversation event on indigenizing the Art Museum virtual series that will open a dialogue, I think, with, uh, with curators at the forefront who are indigenizing art museums and examining institutional practices across this country. And uh, this series was developed uh, by our team at Wapata, which is uh, uh, being focused on global indigeneity. And some of the staff who would like to acknowledge are Brittany uh, Pitsulak Bergen, Natalia Chestopolova, and Mariah Miwasagi. I'd also like to acknowledge Lisa Smith of the Onsite Gallery, which is our sole and great uh, institution, our exhibiting institution here at OCAD University, who's been a key partner for us in many of our projects, including the virtual platform for Indigenous art. And last week, many of you who were able to join us uh, heard the voice of our university president, Anna Serrano who's been a great supporter of this series. So I reach out to her and thank her, as well as our Canada Council, uh, who have been partners in many of our projects. I'd like to acknowledge them. So uh, now let me introduce uh, this week, our special guest, Annika. Welcome from the Jocelyn Art Museum in Omaha, Nebraska the headquartered territory of the Omaha, the Ponca, the Santee Sioux, and the Winnebago tribes. So the Omaha, that's an indigenous term. I had to go look it up in the Wikipedia. I found that it's an indigenous term. Omaha, Omaha. Man, the only time I heard that, that, that term being uttered was watching the NFL football and this crazy quarterback named Peyton Manning, who kept calling out his signals every time he went into the uh, into the huddle and came out, he was saying Omaha, Omaha. <laughs> I don't know what he <laughs> meant by that. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it must have worked somehow, right? Because when he in his last game of his career, he won the Super Bowl. So. I was, I was, I thought it had to mean something. It had to be, um, it had to uh, be an important term. Anyhow, welcome, Annika. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you so much for for inviting me to have a conversation with you, and thank you everybody who's helped make this this call and this interview possible. It's just a, a real honor to speak with you, Gerald, um, and. I should say, yes, I'm speaking from Omaha, Nebraska, which is, you know, territory of the Omaha tribe, and that's where the city takes its name, and the, the name actually means against the current or upstream people and, and refers to the movement of the, the tribe coming up from the south and at one point splitting off from, 
from other uh, similar language speaking communities um, and, and establishing themselves here. So I've, I've talked to Omaha people about this name and how there's something very, very beautiful about being against the current, especially, you know, with younger Omaha folks right now who are really uh, doing these incredible projects towards, you know, getting uh, land back, working with farmers in the region, doing food sovereignty projects. There's a huge urban agriculture movement here. So, you know, I, I think the name is really beautiful. I will also say to your story, football is huge in Nebraska, <laughs> which I know nothing about. <laughs> um, well, but yes, uh, thank you for having me. Yeah. Well, welcome. We, uh, just by way of introduction, you are the Associate Curator of Native American Art with, uh, of course, your specialty is 19th century Native American art of the upper Midwest of the US. That's usually, what is that? Michigan, the Dakotas, Minnesota, that area. And uh, you've been at the Jocelyn now for a couple of years, which is fantastic. Uh, really pleased to have and see a, a major art museum such as the Jocelyn, which has a long history with Native American art that you've been there for a couple of years and that uh, uh, that uh, as we were talking earlier, you mentioned that you're gonna be uh, part of a team of curators who are reinstalling the exhibitions. And I'm looking forward to talking about that, part of your permanent collection. And then of course, a lot of your work that you just pointed out, you know, you're introducing yourself to the uh, communities of Omaha, the indigenous communities, that's uh, really fantastic. Uh, now, also, uh, since your arrival, uh, and I, you had to hit the ground running really, really quickly, uh, you started to work with uh, the Crow artist, the Absalo uh, artist, Wendy Redstar, for an installation. And uh, you, we have an image, so if you want to pull up the image, it's called the Indian Congress, and it was uh, uh, shown this year. And the, just by way of introduction, what I learned uh, briefly, and you can expand on it, is that the Indian Congress, from which the name she takes the name, was one of the largest gathering of American Indian tribes in its time. And this was uh, in conjunction with a major international uh, fair called the Omaha's Trans-Mississippi World Exposition in 1898. And I also found that uh, I realized that the famed uh, or infamous, you know, depending on which side of the border you actually are on, the, <laughs> the Apache warrior Geronimo, who was at the time uh, imprisoned at Fort Sill in Oklahoma. And I think uh, previous to that, he was probably in, in, um, in, in the Florida prison of Fort Marion as well. But anyhow, during this time he was at Fort Sill, came uh, to the, the fair at, uh, in Omaha. So, so let's begin by uh, uh, talking about uh, this uh, project that you did with Wendy, uh, why she chose the theme that she did. So I'm really quite excited to hear what that relationship you uh, started with Wendy. Yeah, so it was a really fun project. It's still currently on view at the museum through April 25th. And it's started quite a while ago. Wendy was a resident at the Bemis Center for Contemporary Arts, which is here in, in Omaha. And she started to build a relationship with the museum before my time there. And I was excited <laughs> when my now former boss said to me, we need you to work on a Wendy Red Star show because her work when I was in grad school was really formative to my thinking about how artists are thinking about dioramas and museum displays of indigenous culture. She has her famous Four, se uh, four Seasons series um, for which she became pretty well known. And we started by just having a conversation and, and on the phone and Wendy said she knew that there was an archive of photographs here made by the, the photographer Frank Reinhardt who was a Nebraskan photographer. And she wanted to look at those uh, she wanted to create a new work specifically for, for this gallery, which is about 500 square feet, so it's a very manageable size. Um, and so I said, okay, come to Omaha, and, and we put together a research trip around Reinhardt and went to uh, the Omaha Public Library, where 
uh, prints of his photographs exist of Indian Congress members. And so there are about 800 Reinhardt photographs in total, and over 600 of those are portraits of individuals from 35 different nations that traveled to Omaha in 1898 to attend the Indian Congress. And this is a, an, an unprecedented event. Um, it was a, a very big moment, not just for fair attendees, but for, for the tribes who traveled great distances to be here. So Wendy, in looking through these portraits, you know, just kind of physically flipping through them in the library, uh, you know, it was great as a curator just to see her observations. She's very much a researcher. She's a scholar of 19th century photography. She knows everything about the history of Absalaga photography. Um, and she just started asking all these questions and kind of came out of that process with a desire to see all of the Congress members at once. Uh, just to feel what that looked like, because she was really interested in just the magnitude of this event. There were over 500 people there. People traveled as families, so there are a lot of women and children there who were photographed in Reinhardt's studio, which, you know, photographs of women and children uh, were less common in the 19th century. And <laughs> so we did a few things. We, you know, tried to track down Reinhardt's studio, visited his grave, found the original encampment site for, for the Indian Congress. And, and at the end, she said, OK, I want reproductions of every single photograph that Reinhardt took in the gallery. And I was like, Wendy, I have no idea how we're going to do this, but we'll make it work. And she uh, had this idea. There's a, a photograph on the right here, also taken by Reinhardt, that's showing one of the exposition booths. And these were booths that states had, different companies had to display new agricultural technology as well as um, agriculture. So she was just kind of charmed by these booths that are showing uh, potatoes and apples neatly lined up on these little shelves surrounded by American flags and bunting and all this fanfare. Uh, so she said she wanted to recreate one of those booths. So that's what we did here in the gallery. Um, and in place of the apples and, and potatoes, she, she put all of the members of Indian Congress as this commentary on the commodification of the tribe members who had traveled to Omaha and sort of ended up uh, having to perform sham battle ceremonies, you know, like the ghost dance. This is eight years after the massacre at Wounded Knee. So there's just a lot of conflict mm -hmm. here that she wants to draw out while simultaneously really kind of immersing the viewer in the presence of, of these individuals. Yeah, it was... Uh... <clears throat> It's interesting, a lot of these uh, fairs that were going on in the late 19th century, and I know that uh, I'd heard of a number of these fairs, like the Chicago World's Fair, in which they had Northwest Coast uh, indigenous folks there setting up their villages. Um, in Europe as well, they had these, uh, these fairs that they brought indigenous peoples from around the world, but they usually call them human zoos, at least that's the contemporary term, I think. Uh, talking mm -hmm. about uh, how indigenous peoples are often uh, set up and displayed. So it's good to see that kind of agency that perhaps uh, was going on at the time. Um, the thing about Wendy that you mentioned that she uh, responds uh, really well to using 19th century photographs, right? Because there's a lot, I mean, I remember when I was a youngster in art school, how we relied so much on 19th century photographs of photographers, right? And we got to know the photographers. You got to know a lot of the images really well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been a, a, a really a long practice. But Wendy in particular has been uh, looking and using photography in really, really interesting ways. And I, I'd like you to talk a bit more of that. Uh, could we have the next slide, for example? And uh, Yes, and, and here's a close-up of what she's done on the left. And a photograph you mentioned about Reinhardt, uh, the photographer uh, who took this photograph of Alexander Upshaw. Can you, uh, there's a story there, isn't there, about Upshaw, one that 
uh, when I read, it was really rather sad, but give us some context behind the photographs as you see here. And perhaps, uh, again, if you want to add more about Reinhardt, but uh, I think Upshaw, the story is just incredible. Yeah, and this occurred at a really interesting moment in his life. And and just to step back for a second, you know, you're seeing an image of all of the, the Congress members lined up, and every single one of these people has a story. And I think that that was, you know, Wendy will speak to um, Absalaga stories. Alexander Upshaw is an Absalaga or Crow man. <laughs> She, she won't speak to the stories of people from other tribes, you know, and that's kind of her hope with this piece is that this, this can draw out stories. But yeah, Upshaw at, at the, the Congress, when he was there, he was employed by the BIA. He was a teacher at the Genoa School in Nebraska, which was a boarding school in Western Nebraska. And he had just graduated from Carlisle and gone through teacher training also in Pennsylvania. And so he had just actually moved to the state and was a current BIA employee and was asked to be a translator at Indian Congress. So there's this like really great photograph of all of the, the translators for the different tribes and they're lined up and they all have these hats that say the language that they were speaking on, on their hats. And, you know, there's a great, um, article um, by Shimon Zemir about Alexander Upshaw that just wonderfully traces this history. Um, but I guess he, so he was photographed by Reinhardt. This is one of those portraits wearing, you know, a suit, his hair is cut. He's, he's just graduated from Pratt. He had written some articles that were kind of internalizing some of Pratt's ideology. And I guess Reinhardt you know, and, and the, the BIA representatives had asked him to, to don, you know, more Indian looking attire and he refused to wear a, a war bonnet, but he ended up wearing this kind of beaded buckskin suit. And he looks really disgruntled and upset in the photo. And, you know, one of his uh, Carlisle fellow graduates, Richard Davis, who is Cheyenne, was also there at Congress and and is shown wearing the same suit in the photos. So these are the sorts of things that Wendy was paying attention to. Um, you know, who's wearing the same regalia, what were the circumstances for that. But eventually, you know, Upshaw was the interpreter when Reinhardt traveled to the Crow Reservation two years after Indian Congress. And he eventually was an interpreter and cultural liaison for Edward Curtis. And by Curtis's time, he had sort of renounced his affiliation with, with Pratt and the whole assimilationist ideology and had really um, em embraced his cultural roots and became an activist. And unfortunately, they got, that got him killed. He was murdered by, by whites um, in Montana. Hmm. So it's, you know, his story really traces this this turn of the century trajectory and, and shows the complicated um, identity that, that Congress members were, were navigating at this time. And you can just see it in, in really simple things, even like clothing. Um, you, yeah, I, I was wondering if your mic had turned off. Okay. <laughs> um, now, at the outset, I, when I introduced you, uh, I mentioned that your, your uh, specialty and interest is uh, 19th century material. Uh, and I think that Jocelyn has uh, quite a good collection of uh, objects from that, that period. But there's another part of the Jocelyn, which I was really quite excited when we were talking earlier uh, to find out that you have this an amazing collection uh, what I remember is this story. It's a, it's, it's a collection of uh, by an artist, a Zurich-born artist by the name of Carl Bodmer. And Carl Bodmer uh, came to Omaha area in 1832 and was around there for a couple of, year, couple, couple of years. And he came with this uh, prince, this German prince named Maximilian Zuvid, I think that was his name. And so uh, before... And, and Maximilian had, as I understood it, he had gone to South America. He was a naturalist or interested in natural history. 
had, uh, I think, was probably inspired by Alexander von uh, Humboldt uh, in, the ninth, uh, in, the, in that period. And then uh, Maximilian went to South America, you know, years later. And then on his next trip, he was interested in doing the same thing in North America. And so he uh, discovered and found uh, this young uh, painter, this young artist out of Zurich uh, and, and brought him with them. And he was age 23 and I couldn't, uh, I, I just was confounded by the, his youth and how amazing he was. And so I remember in my youth, looking and finding these amazing uh, works by this artist by the name of Carl Bodmer. And so it seemed to me, uh, and Bodmer, of course, was uh, w grew up at a time of the German Romantic period, the art period in which, uh, you know, the romance was all in the air. So this, when we think of romance, romantic, and then him coming to North America and and painting these amazing portraits of Native Americans, that they're spectacularly romantic, but yet there's a realism to that. I think that that's really quite interesting and quite uh, profound. But it's these kind of images that, uh, for my youth, and I think for some young people who are now doing a lot of research in 19th century uh, visuality, look at these early representations by artists like Bodmer. So I was interested if you could tell us about that. So uh, Brittany, if we can get to the next slide, could you tell us about this collection uh, uh, and perhaps by way of these watercolors, what stories are there? Annika, I think your mic, you're, um, I think you're on mute. There we go. Can you hear yeah. me now? Yeah, yeah. we can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. So the Bodmer collection is really foundational to the Durham Center of the American West, which is part of Joslin Art Museum. And there are over 400 watercolors and, and just under 100 of those are portraits. And, you know, like you said, it's incredible. Bodmer was in his 20s when he traveled up the Missouri River. So they came from Europe. Um, through New York, <laughs> up the Mississippi, you know, eventually connecting in St. Louis and, and going as far as present day Montana. And along the way, he painted portraits of, of prominent leaders who were primarily um, doing business with the American Fur Trade Company, who were meeting with U.S. officials. So a lot of the, the men, when they posed for Bodmer, are wearing their peace medals, like the man you see at the right. Um, and, and really prepared for these, these formal portraits. Um, you know, one thing that's been pointed out to me, I've had a lot of conversations with various indigenous people who are, who are from uh, these communities that he visited, so Upper Plains, and, and just to get the take on, on Bodmer, and uh, specifically Jar Baker, he's a Mandan Hidadza man, former uh, National Park Service, uh, director of Indian Relations, and, you know, he's just an expert on this material, and, you know, I think, like non-Native audiences, it's really fascinated with his level of detail and his precision, and, and these do convey information, but there's a danger in this notion of accuracy, and what Gerard said to me is we have to take Bodmer and Maximilian's drawings and words because Maximilian documented their whole journey and, and documented a lot about what these, these encounters look like, these encounters of, of making portraits. And I said, you know, we just, we have to take this with a grain of salt. And uh, I think as a curator, that, that's what has been the, the challenge, the excitement, um, it's just really where the rich texture is of working with a collection like this is how do you take it? Where, where does that grain of salt lie? And I think it's what brings these early 19th century paintings into the present day. So for, um, I'm working on a number of Bodmer projects right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really fortunate to be at Joslin to be able to do that. One of them, a show just opened at the Met in New York that that was co-organized by us. 
and we decided for the show to commission a number of essays that are incorporated throughout the galleries. And one of those is written by a woman who's um, Omaha or Omaha. Mm -hmm. And she wrote about this portrait of a young boy on the left. And, you know, that while labels are short, they're 120 words, they, can, they can't do enough. And we had conversations with all of the authors prior you know, and throughout this process. And, and she told us this wonderful story of how Carl Bodmer's images, she's always used them in teaching um, Omaha tradition and culture courses. She's a teacher at the Nebraska Indian Community College. And, you know, how she sort of navigates that, that grain of salt with her students. And so, you know, that, that really got me thinking about how you can, um, how 19th century portraits have relevance today, how they can be used in various ways. I've talked to regalia makers who, you know, Bodmer, you know that every feather that he painted, you can tell that the bird species that it came from and that's really critical information. And you can tell how they're painted and cut in different ways, which, which in itself is a, a form of, of portraiture that speaks to somebody's identity, that speaks to their accomplishments, their, their contributions to their community. So, you know, these are used as reference images as well, and, and they're also used to tell stories about, about the present day. Uh, the curator, Dakota Hoska, I don't know if she's attending the call, if she is, hello, Dakota. Um, she wrote just a lovely essay about the woman in the center here who's Lakota and is wearing this beautiful, you know, the box and border style painted robe. And, and Dakota writes about how now, you know, women aren't making those robes, but star quilts have, have replaced the robes and that they still have that same effect of, of um, wrapping an individual in the care of her community. So, you know, I think there are so many interesting things that can be done with a collection like this, and we're just kind of at the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I think a lot of visitors to the gallery in the past, there were so many shows mm -hmm. on American mm -hmm. Western art in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and I, I was looking in our database on, we have an Alfred Jacob Miller collection, another artist explorer who, who traveled um, through, through uh, the West. <laughs> big quotes around West. And, uh, you know, the, there were like 12 different shows and they all had the word West in the title of the show. And I just thought, well, you know, actually the benefit of these portraits is that they were painted on the homelands of these individuals. It's not like the portraits that were painted in DC. So how does that aspect of, of homeland sort of reorient how we're understanding the West, you know, as a framework of, as a, as what has been the predominant geographic framework for, for interpreting a number of, of pictures of indigenous people. So yeah. long answer to your question, but there's a lot that can be done with Bodmer. Yes, I think there's, and there continues to be every year, uh, an interest in, in Bodmer. But you know, you talked about this tip of the iceberg. Uh, another tip of the iceberg, if we can go to the next image, for example, is uh, indigenous views, right? Uh, indigenous artists such as this one. Uh, you know, when I was reading Bodmer in my early days, I you know, came across this name of Matatope or forebears who came in contact and befriended uh, Bodmer. And I was interested in that kind of relationship because they were kind of drawing each other. And I'm wondering if you could uh, talk a bit more about these particular works because Matatope was a military and religious leader of his community. And so he was obviously an important person. And, uh, but the relationship, I was, I was quite interested. But could you tell us more about these two works I mean, and certainly about Matatope? Yeah, so Matatope, uh, forebears how his name translates, he's a Mandan leader, and really at this time, uh, a crucial figure to have on your side if you were not a Native person or not from this community. He was really the, the gatekeeper to his community, and, and 
they welcomed Bodmer and Maximilian, the Mandan and Hidatsa. The villages were very close together. And um, Bodmer and Maximilian ended up staying at Fort Clark, which is adjacent to the village of Mitarahankush, which is a Mandan village. They stayed there for five months, and that was during during the winter time. So it was really the time of, of storytelling. And there's plenty of downtime to paint portraits and to have conversations in this, you know, temporary studio space. So I think, you know, Bodmer and Maximilian had to hew very closely to Mandan and Hidatsa customs of, of generosity, um, in particular of relationship building. And you might not be able to see that in the portraits, but the, the very fact that Bodmer painted two portraits of forebears, you know, speaks to their, their relationship and just the trust that had to be built to get to that point. And also forebears, you know, his understanding of, of Bodmer and Maximilian's connections to a much larger world of the American fur trade, of, you know, white world, the American fur trade, um, going all the way back to to Europe too. So he has a lot of agency in this process. But yeah, so four bears and another uh, Mandan man named Yellow Feather spent a lot of time in, in Bodmer and Maximilian's quarters. I think uh, Yellow Feather visited like almost 40 times and Maximilian's journals mentions four bears being there and really introducing them to different prominent families you know, Bodmer has this incredible interior view of a Mandan Earth Lodge, which certainly I think would have taken a while to build the the rapport in order to to spend time with a family inside an Earth Lodge like that. Um, and the interest really went both ways. You know, Maximilian documents forebears. Um, just asking Bodmer about his paintings and drawing of it himself using Bodmer's watercolors and his, you know, pencils and paper. And one of the products of those interactions is the drawing you see on the right. And I think there was probably a fair level of negotiation around what um, what the content of, of the, the drawings that Maximilian retained would be. Um, so this drawing on the right is currently in Joslin's collection as well. And this is a, a vignette that Forbearance had painted on a number of war exploit robes. So it's just one detail from, you know, on a robe would be a, a series of his, his coups, his accomplishments. And he's on the left and he's, you know, in, in the midst of battle with the Cheyenne chief and he's grabbing the knife and, and it's bleeding as he's grabbing the knife, but he ultimately comes out victorious. And I, you know, I think that moment for Forebear surely was something worth commemorating, and I'm sure he shared that story with, with Bodmer and Maximilian. Um, he also painted it on a robe that he gifted to the travelers, which, you know, again speaks to, to the, the tribe uh, custom of generosity, but also, again, that relationship that, that was built between the two of them. Um, I think if you could go to the next slide, I do have slide. some... Yeah, let's talk about the next slide of uh, Sichida, and uh, who is a contemporary in, in, of, of Four Bears and others. And uh, mm -hmm. tell me about this one, because what I was yeah. interested, what I was interested in this idea that now we're shifting, you know, from from Bodmer's a very Western point of view, uh, very as I said earlier about from this Romantic period now to an indigenous point of view, a Mandan point of view, right? We're now looking through Mandan eyes, as it were, uh, a kind of a reverse gaze about what was going on at that time. So what can you tell us about this particular the work by Sichita? Yeah, so there are eight drawings in Jocelyn's collections that have been attributed to Sichita. Um, I think there still needs to be more time spent with those drawings, but we're pretty sure. Um, and he was quite a bit younger than Forebears and really hung around Bodmer Studio quite a bit and, and you know, was taking them to various sites and again, just kind of acting as this, this cultural intermediary. 
but these drawings, like the one on the left, it's just so interesting because what he's showing lined up around the, the top border and the right border are, you can see trade blankets, um, rifles. So these are the different items that he had either given away um, um, or traded for. So I, I do have a question as to whether this is a portrait of, of Si Chida. I think um, there's an assumption that a lot of the, the drawings that are in the collection of his are self-portraits. And, you know, typically within a, a Plains tradition of, of hide painting, certainly, of, you know, the war exploit robes, those are, you know, self-portraits. They're, they're descriptions of, of very specific incidents in one's own life. But I think what really interested Si Chida or Yellow Feather um, was the fact that Bodmer is painting other individuals and, and from life. You mm -hmm. know, it's that process of, of creating in front of another person. And if you think about what those long portrait sessions would look like, Bodmer painted some portraits really quickly when he had to. But otherwise, you know, that was multiple hours. You would imagine that people would probably smoke a pipe, share dinner, lunch, and, and talk through an interpreter at least. So that was a different type of interaction that came from creating images. So, you know, I question if the, the figure on the right here is, is yellow feather, it might be one of his, um, you know, somebody in his family, somebody in a society with him. And he's definitely drawn out some of the society insignia, um, you know, the staff and his headpiece that's probably otter fur, which would, you know, indicate who he's affiliated with. Um, and so that also, I think, points to the, the fact that how men presented themselves in Bodmer's portrait, you know, he documents the hours that people had spent preparing for these, is that, you know, that was also an act of, of self-portraiture, of, of sharing your identity, which maybe wouldn't have been as visible to somebody like Bodmer and Maximilian, but would have very clearly stated who they were. Um, in society. So I think that, you know, Yellow Feather is, is both following this, this tradition of self-portraiture and identification via, you know, one's regalia, um, but also taking an interest in this uh, different dynamic process and very um, engaged process of, of portrait painting from life. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that, uh, uh, that we notice when we look at these early drawings, 19th century drawings by artists from the plains, uh, you know, by warrior artists, it's, it, it really is a lot about the exploits, you know, about wars against, uh, whether it's other uh, tribes, uh, but more mm -hmm. importantly, it's usually against the American US cavalry at the time. So it's full of, uh, you know, action. It's full of, you know, kind of, as I said, these exploits. And I want to move now to just a different area, which is quite the opposite. You know, when the plains, you know, with its the dynamism, dynamism that was going on in the 19th century, to something fairly different. And it's from your collection. I was quite excited that I, to realize when I was going to talk to you about this piece that I'd known for a number of years, but didn't know too much. So if we go to the next slide, it's from the Northwest Coast, and I know that Northwest Coast is not your specialty, but. I, you know, what interests me in a lot of works like this one is this kind of representation, the reverse gaze, if you will, of indigenous uh, artists looking at Europeans, which is totally an understudied area and something that is of great interest to me. So can you talk, talk to us, tell us about this Haida mask, which I find uh, there's some humor in it for some reason, but uh, you know, there's a realism to it. Yeah, absolutely. This is just an incredible mask and I was so excited when I started at Jawsman to be able to look at it in person and, and spend some time with it. I'm also glad you said that I'm not <laughs> a height of art expert. I always feel a little, you know, still a little bit shaky about, you know, talking about artwork made outside of the plains, which, you know, I think Jill talked about this in her interview last week that, you know, we have to, as, as, like one person departments navigate all of these different regions with, with intensely diverse practices. So I'll tell you what I 
what I know about this, which is that for a long time, it's been called a sea captain's mask. And it's, it's depicting a person of European descent. He has red hair and beard, which is a telltale sign in carvings from what I'm learning, you know, from the Pacific Northwest, as well as the plains, these carved depictions of white men. So there's his beard painted red, and then there are these glass inlays along his nose and cheeks that probably represent freckles. And one of the first things I do when I look at these objects that are, you know, really at the intersection of two cultures, this is saying something about an exchange, right? And um, the first thing I do is look to see how it's been used. Um, if there's evidence of any ceremonial use, you know, ha has this been used in, in a dance, for instance? And, and there are tiny holes on the back and there's a thin strap, but I'm, I'm not convinced. Um, but at the same time, there are actual eye holes and nose holes and a slit in the mouth. So could this have served a practical function or could this have been a mask that was made for sale for trade made as a commission that just really retains some of the the functional elements of of Haida mass um, while still taking on this very naturalistic form that you know I'm called portraiture um, so I also think about the collection histories this was collected by a man named George Emmons who again I'm learning more about I guess he he worked in Alaska uh, in the 1880s with Clinkett communities and, and amassed quite a large collection that's in New York at the moment. But this, in our records, says it's collected in 1919. So, you know, perhaps, perhaps it's an item that stayed on the Pacific Northwest Coast for a while. Perhaps it's showing a missionary. You know, there are a lot of missionaries in, in Minnesota who had tobacco pipes with their portraits carved into the pipe that were gifts. So maybe this was a missionary in that region. Maybe this was um, some sort of government or, or military official who was stationed there and, and was there for a while. Or it could have been an item, you know, made for this influx of, of Europeans who really desired uh, works of Haida art. You know, there are these incredible oh my gosh, these incredible Haida panel pipes. I know you're familiar with them uh, that depict Europeans and they're, they're on a ship and they'll be entangled in all these ropes and shown upside down and just sort of is, you know, bumbling in these nonsensical situations. And they're so funny, you know, and these were really desired by, by mariners, by people who were coming to trade with, with Haida individuals. So I think there are a lot more questions to, to be asked about this. Indeed. Well, one of the questions, uh, and I wanted to sort of get to your area of specialty, uh, but moving from this particular mask to the next one, what I wanted to say just briefly is that one of the positive aspects of contact with Europeans was the, was the introduction of steel tools, in particular uh, carving knives, which enabled the artists to do spectacular uh, and very intricate kinds of art, uh, uh, sculpting, such as this one here. So let's go to the next one because this is from a, a recent uh, set of, uh, uh, from a, 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 an essay you, you, you just completed in which uh, you're you've worked with uh, as a Wasechu, as a white scholar, <laughs> as the Dakota would probably say, uh, mm -hmm. But you've worked with uh, the Dakotas, uh, the Dakota people, scholars and knowledge keepers. Uh, and I'm interested in that process of, of you working with them. But here are some of these ancestral pipes, these uh, red pipestone, or sometimes known as Catlinite, which is this stone that's so similar to what we just moved from Haida, the Haida uh, stone, the argillite stone that they used uh, spectacularly for and still continue to use. But Catalan, it's the same kind of material, only it's red. And the Dakota call it, what is it, Inyansa, I think is their term for this, a sacred blood red stone. And uh, what you see here are two men 
on the left. They look like they're at a table drinking and sharing in a drink. And then a figure on the right, this kind of Janus face, two-faced figure, you know, which uh, often has very negative connotations. So am I right in my observations? And can you tell us a bit more about this, uh, about uh, these pipes? Yeah, these tobacco pipes are both just fascinating. <laughs> I came to the, I came to research Dakota's tobacco pipe through a roundabout way a little bit later in my graduate work. Um, you know, I first started looking at the portraits of George Catlin and representations of, of Dakota leaders in, in present day Minnesota, or Minnesota Mokoche and um, I began asking questions about who, who these individuals were, and a lot of them were posing with tobacco pipes, with a long wooden stem and then a red pipe at the end. And I began to research what those pipes are, and that's that's the point when my research really shifted from a focus on Euro-American painters to Dakota artworks and what the exchanges between the two were. So, you know, Catlinite. I don't use this word anymore. It's a, <laughs> because uh, Catlin, George Catlin, he was an artist who, who like Bodmer, traveled up, up the Missouri River, also up the Mississippi River. And he really trespassed on Dakota land. So there's, there's a single quarry where this comes from um, that, that's in kind of the corner, the lower corner of Minnesota. And when he went up to Fort Snelling, which was the, the military fort, um, and started meeting with Dakota leaders, he was asking about this quarry that he heard about, and they said, no, you can't go there. And he kind of pressed them and said, well, why not? And one man told him, if you, if you take a piece of this stone, you're gonna take part of our flesh. And once you do that, we'll never stop bleeding. And Catlin went, he went to the quarry and he took several samples of the stone, sent it back to the East Coast, said he had discovered this unique stone and that he's naming it Catlinite. So that's such a colonial claim on this incredibly significant um, material that seems to be a living stone. And when you smoke out of a pipe, it, it can uh, transmit your prayers. You know, and this activates the stone. This is is in a lot of stories the the flesh of ancestors. So, you know, I, I started asking around, and I I met a Dakota man named Shashoka Duda or Joe Bendixson, um, and just asking him about the terminology. What what is this called? And he said it's called Iyasha. And just that question of what can language do and shifting how we think about materiality um, and kind of it's important to tell this this story you know of, of Catlin's journey and sort of the impact that his form of representation the, the very real impacts that this had on Dakota communities but I also think it's important to pivot away from that and language is a way that we can do that and for instance you know what would it look like if in all of our museum databases you know, we had uh, indigenous languages in, in place of, of these colonial terms. So I'm not a fluent Dakota speaker by any means. Um, and I think that that's one of kind of the issues with, with the discipline that I come from, which is art history, um, mm -hmm. where that wasn't really part of my, my training. Um, but it was this major pivot point for me in thinking about how these tobacco pipes were, were operating at the time and the materiality of them. So I, I started to find this really strong tr tradition of portrait pipe carving, um, as well as animals. You see a lot of animals carved on pipe bowls, but around the time that, that Americans really came into the region, you see this kind of proliferation of, of figurative pipes. And the one on the left is showing a chief, presumed to be a chief because he's actually wearing a peace medal. Um, and another figure, and they're presumed to be drinking whiskey, which was often part of these trade negotiations, as was 
smoking a pipe, but sort of, you know, uh, uh, doubling up those those traditions. Um, and that's probably the stern wheel of a of a steamboat. So also again, the steamboat coming into the region and being this major mechanism of trade. And and the question I had was, well, this this was definitely made for an outsider. It ended up being collected by the War Department. Um, and uh, it has a flat base, which, you know, older pipes don't have a flat base. It was made to stand up. It was made to be displayed. The pipe bowl is really small, so you, it, it would be difficult to smoke out of. And I started asking, you know, if, if the Dakota people at the time were really reluctant to have outsiders go to the quarry, you know, what about the just proliferation of pipes that were being gifted and traded to, to whites? And so I started just peeking in the bowl and seeing if they had been smoked or not. And the pipe on the left hasn't been smoked and, and just started kind of guessing, you know, which which pipes have been smoked. If they've been smoked, they've been activated. And and that's significant. So again, the use of this material and the, and the use of these objects are really important. Um, the, the tobacco pipe on the right, there's been some literature that said it's a, it represents uh, Heoka, which is a figure uh, in Dakota cosmology, who, who, not a sacred clown figure, but um, somebody who does the opposite of what's expected to sort of reveal these these essential truths about our humanity. But he also does, it, as you've pointed out to me, Gerald, have the kind of standard features of Europeans and plains representation, so potentially a brim of the hat and these elongated noses. There are also a lot of tobacco pipes in the same shape where the bowl will be a barrel of whiskey. So it's just, you know, I just continued to, to track down these artworks and, and in the meantime, talking to more and more Dakota people, you know, typos, artists, carvers, elders about these artworks and really came to understand that, you know, I, there are limits for me as a non-Native researcher as to what I can, even the questions to ask and the information to share and the appropriateness of putting these on display, for instance, in a museum, um, how to handle them, how to properly store them, how to care for these living objects. So, you know, I very much shifted to the objects that were made explicitly for, for exchange, such as these two pipes. Right. Yeah. So in the few minutes that we have left, <clears throat> let's switch gears for now. So um, what I wanted uh, to take off on some of the ideas that you just presented about working with uh, some of the communities uh, and understanding how language is critical to the articulation of these objects. And I think that that's something we began talking about last week with Jill, and I'd like to continue that along that same lines with you and others in the coming mm -hmm. weeks, because I think it's in a critical juncture where we're at in art history, uh, perhaps in indigenous art history, and, and how we have to start from a different basis. So let me just uh, uh, bring up a, a man that I know fairly well. His name is Stephen Gilchrist who is an Aboriginal Australian art historian and curator who has done a number of exhibitions in the, in the US and in Australia. And uh, I noticed that uh, he was interviewed uh, uh, in a magazine, in a, sorry, in a journal that you uh, edited called Contemporaneity. And when I was reading this, uh, I came across this uh, quote in which uh, he says that colonization is not the meta narrative of indigeneity. And I just, I looked at that and I stared at that and I, I, and all of a sudden it just, things started to bubble up. You know, it, was, it, it sounded very provocative, but I, you know, I, <laughs> but I think it gets at the heart of what this series is about, what we're talking about, because, you know, we can't always talk about indigenous art in relation to colonization, but rather, as you are saying, to some degree, 
let's get back to the indigenous sources such as place, history, identity, ceremony, et cetera. It's a challenging idea, I know, uh, particularly for uh, non-Indigenous curators, but I think it's where a lot of Indigenous curators are going to. So I'd like your perspective on this and perhaps how you're wor working with Indigenous folks that are influencing, like Mr. Baker, are influencing the way that you're seeing, this new way of seeing. Mm -hmm. I love that. Stephen Gilchrist quote in that interview that he did with Henry Scarrett, you know, that that was a huge turning point for me as well of just how to flip the narrative and, and how he approaches his curation. Um, you know, I, I think in graduate school, decolonization was the word. I was so jazzed on it. I was so motivated by it. I mean, this is when, you know, decolonize this place in New York City, a group in New York City was staging occupations of the museum. And it, it, it seemed to me to be decolonization to be this very sort of museum practice directed term. Um, and very much about museums, whether they be art, art history museums or, or natural history museums to be directed at this, this process of undoing. And I think that that's good. I think that a lot of work needs to be done. And that's partially what my role is, you know, especially as a non-Indigenous curator. And I'm working with people outside of the institution and I'm inside the institution. And I have a lot of work to do to really unsettle some of those structures, which comes down to just it's day-to-day -day work. It's spreadsheets. It's databases. The colonialist structure is in all of it, you know, it's in funding, it's in departments. But I also think that, you know, he's of course right. Coloniality, that doesn't need to be the narrative. And, and it's a challenge because I think it's important that colonization be spoken about very frankly in the galleries because in, in a state like Nebraska, you know, people haven't had the education that they need um, um, on the history of the, the colonization of this place. But at the same time, it's also not my role as curator to dictate the narrative and to tell the stories and to say when, you know, labels or when artworks are there to talk about pain and violence, surviving, that you know that's not my role to 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 say when those stories are told and what the content of those stories are so i see indigenizing as very much being a community centered practice a multi vocal practice one that requires building relationships having conversations i see indigenizing the museum the majority of the work i do for that is happening outside of the institution it's you know showing up at uh, memorials, it's showing up at rallies, it's, it's showing up for community events, and it's just talking to people and, and showing support. I think it's just an inherently um, uh, activist practice or, or a practice that's related to contemporary events. Um, and in terms of, you know, storytelling, I have brought people through the museum, of course, and a lot of Mama people through the institution and just started to have these conversations of, okay, if you could reimagine the galleries, you know, these, this is on your land, what would that look like? And, and what are the stories that would come out? And I had reached out to a man who is a descendant of a, a chief named Big Elk, and we have a portrait of Big Elk in the American galleries. And I said, you know, just in my early days of getting to know the museum and trying to test what different interventions look like. And I said, do you want to write something or, or do something around this painting, you know, sort of leave it open, but kind of thinking that he'd maybe write a, a reflective label about it. And, you know, he said he wanted to talk to his sister, who's a fluent Umaha speaker, and sort of defer to her. She's older than him and, and is the fluent speaker. And and she said she wanted to translate a speech of Big Elk that 
had been given um, probably in the 1840s, and that was recorded, uh, was written down, but only in English. And she said she wanted to translate, retranslate that back into Maha. And she worked on that for a long time, thinking about who his audience was, who is he speaking to, what were the circumstances that all changes the nuances of the language, and what that experience really impressed upon me in, in working with the two of them. They, they both made it clear that it's important to have his words in the gallery, and that is going to activate that painting. That is going to be a really powerful moment. So you have to do that properly. You have to do that with ceremony, with family present, et cetera. So I think this is something that Stephen Gilchrist talks about too, is the act of presencing objects. Um, and I say objects, but they're not objects. You know, these, a lot of people come in and they say, this, these are ancestors and, and uh, they should be treated as such. So that process of activation, I think, can happen in a number of ways, but it's thinking about, you know, the museum as this space for, for so much life and so many stories. And, and you know, again, my, my position in that, I sort of go with the flow and, and you know, I'm there as a facilitator, I guess. Um, I'm there to open the doors and to have conversations. And I think I'm at a very early stage in, in seeing the number of opportunities and the number of ideas and programs and, and things that can happen in that space. Um, so <laughs> long answer short, <laughs> uh, you know, I think it's really important that that museums do that work, especially when in my initial conversations, you know, I arrived and just talked to people at the Urban Indian Health Center, the uh, intertribal student group, you know, just reach out to people and introduce myself. And the, the main response I got is that, you know, a lot of people just hadn't been to the museum and hadn't been invited. And I thought, well, that's an issue. So step number one is, is welcoming and, and um, figuring out how to just make collections available to people who want to see them. So I say, bring your grandma, bring your grandson, <laughs> you know, you're welcome here. Yes, well, um, Annika, we are certainly um, looking forward to the next uh, reinstall at the Jocelyn. You know, next time I drive down back through the prairies, I'll make sure it's, it goes through Omaha. Yes. I think it's an important institution where you're working and the work that you're doing with the local communities of Omaha and really across the prairies, across the plains. And I think that that's really important work. Um, I think the work you're doing with the indigenous communities really getting back to the uh, to the land and how that's looked at and perhaps having that influence, you know, in indigenizing the museum rather than uh, uh, looking at it from a decolonial perspective, but rather look at it maybe now, as you said, we need to start indigenizing it. And that really carries a different discursive practice that, that, mm -hmm. that, 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 that begins with community, it begins with uh, uh, the knowledge, what we call visual knowledge and new ways of seeing, indigenous ways of seeing, mm -hmm. bringing that into the discourse of the, of the a narrative that we've grown used to over these years and accepted as natural, you know? And so you're mm -hmm. gonna overlook so much. And like this, a uh, lot of the Native American uh, art from the 19th century uh, and even contemporary art. So that's where I think, as you point out, indigenizing the museum is just that one step and a, a good step. So we're looking forward to, uh, to what's gonna happen uh, in four years. So thank you very much, Annika. There's many more, uh, I'm sure many more questions I could ask as well as our audience. And I wanted to really thank you very much for uh, coming here this afternoon, spending uh, time away uh, from your own work, but uh, nonetheless, it's uh, important work. And I'm really, really pleased uh, that you were able to make it today. And I wanted to thank you. And I'm sure the audience does it well as well. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, to conclude uh, today's remarks, let me once again thank uh, the president, uh, Anna Serrano, who's uh, underwritten this series of talks. She's our university president. I'd also like to thank the Canada Council who've been also supporters of this series. And I'd like a shout out to some of the people behind the scenes, such as uh, Saidi Akbar, Saida Akbari uh, and Renzi Guaran, uh, who are uh, running the IT today and uh, quite seamlessly, by the way. And I want to also say to stay tuned next week, uh, our special guest will be uh, Greg Hill, who is the senior curator of Indigenous Art for the National Gallery. Uh, upcoming guests will include folks like uh, uh, Rianne Chartrand, uh, Jocelyn Pirininen, uh, Jamie Isaac, Patricia Norby, and the list goes on. So stay tuned. Uh, you can see the full listing on the Eventbrite page, the registration page, as well as on-site. Uh, I mentioned on-site earlier. And then, of course, if you go to wapata.com on our website, you can uh, see uh, more information. So once again, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Annika, and I bid you a good day. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.